Amen, family. This is good. Good morning, family. I got to ask it one more time. Coming from the GLC, good morning, family. Amen. We are in the house of God, and it is awesome just to really be here. Um, I'm excited because um, it's once again great to be with the Dallas family, man. Uh, we had such an incredible time with the Global Leadership family, amen, and uh, we, we were out last week at the Global, Global Leadership Conference in Anaheim, California, and it was such an incredible thing, as J4 mentioned, you had people from all over the world. It was truly a global family coming together, and uh, there is there's such an incredible thing about family. Every two years, disciples from all over the world come together at the Global Leadership Conference to get strengthened, encouraged through fellowship and the Word of God. And this morning, as the Dallas family, God has the same intentions for us. He's, gonna, he's bringing us together so that we can get encouragement and fellowship as family. Given, I was given the charge uh, and asked to speak on family, amen? The very essence of what God intended from the very beginning. And my charge is entitled, Family of God. Now, I don't have a lot of time. It's very uh, sort of like an excerpt vi- version of what I really would want to speak about. But I'm going to do my best to do it in the 10 or so minutes that I have, amen? Uh, family of God. That's, that's what it's, it's entitled this morning, Family of God. And, you know, we have to protect it. It is such an incredible thing. When, you, when we went out to the Global Leadership Conference, to see all the incredible disciples. You had disciples there. Some were just baptized that same week prior. Others were baptized two months. Others were, had many, many years in the faith. But we all were part of God's family. And it's such an refreshing feeling to be amongst family, especially your spiritual family. God is the architect of family. God is the one who builds family, and God knows how to build family. God has always wanted a family, and he loves the idea of family. God loves what family represents. God puts his family together, and now here we are as one body in the body of Christ. From the very beginning, God realized that we needed a family. Genesis 2 verse 18 said, it is not good for man to be alone. He realized that, wait a minute, Adam here needs a family, and he created Eve. That was the first family created. 1 Corinthians, let's turn our Bibles, turn your Bibles with me to to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 14. And we're really going to start to see how God, how incredible he is when he brings people together and what that represents. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 14, and we're also going to look at 18 to 20 as well as 27. So we're going to skip around in that same passage. It says, just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we all were baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. But in fact, in verse 18, it says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, Where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. 27 says, we're going to go down. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Amen? Every one of us makes up the body of Christ. We make the family of God. God says here in the scriptures that it was God who put them together as he wanted them to be. So when you ask yourself the question, why am I here? Sometimes we can have the the thoughts of, of, of trying to understand where we fit in. God 
purposely and intentionally placed you in this family here this morning. Amen. God knew what he was doing. The body of Christ represents family. If you're visiting, I would like to challenge you to study the Bible to learn how to become part of God's spiritual family. God actually adopts us into his family. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, and you can go with me here. It says that God decided in advance to adopt us in his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. God saw mankind, and God wanted us to be part of his family. Uh, Just looking back at the, the communion, it's really reconciling us to him and his family. And God said that he decided to adopt us, amen? We didn't just become part of God's family. God did deliberately pulled us in. He made the decision to go after us so that we can now be part of his spiritual family. Now, I'm not talking about the family in the conventional sense. A lot of times when we hear the word family, the first thing that happens is we can think of our own experiences and what we've gone through in our homes growing up. And based on what we may have known growing up in our families or what we've experienced, that is not necessarily what family represents in God's eye. No, I'm talking about what God intended family to be. And we're going to look at what, what did God intend family to look like, our spiritual family this morning. One thing about humans that we can always be rest assured is Humans have always had the ability to mess things up, amen, like me. And, and, and that is what we have managed to do with family when God is absent, when God is absent. Family is such an important component. It's such a special thing. Uh, it's a component of the human experience, which is why Satan tends to target the family. Satan hates the concept of family, and has always wanted to destroy it. In our society nowadays, the concept of family is so vague and ambiguous, and it's not clear. Even the definition of family, as I was looking up, I was like, never mind, that is not God's family, amen, has been altered to mean something different. But why? Why is spiritual family such a threat to Satan. Let's look at why, amen. Why? Why does, what does family provide that would make family, a spiritual family, such a threat to Satan? Family provides a few things. Family provides security and refuge, amen. It provides an atmosphere and environment where one can grow and thrive. Family provides love, It provides encouragement and direction. So it makes perfect sense why Satan would be threatened by our family here in Dallas-Fort Worth and across the world. (laughs) Satan is threatened by a strong spiritual family. He's really threatened by it. The kingdom of God is that place. And we have to maintain what that means. We have to maintain what God has instituted from the very beginning for family to mean. We have to protect that. Some of the most utilized scriptures describe what the spiritual family was like for our first century brothers and sisters. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And it's the most notable one that we all are familiar with, amen, in the first principle studies. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, this is what family looked like to God in the first century. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They prayed. Everyone was filled with awe and at many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every single day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. 
They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This was God's vision of what a family was to be. This is what he had in mind. It was a safe place built on God's word, vulnerability, transparency, and the foundation of the family was in the scriptures. And the people were happy. They were thriving and they were close. But this, I want to remind you, is a threat to Satan. Amen. Three things. We're going to look at just three things that God has put on my heart. Satan's main ingredients to destroy the spiritual family. There are others, but these are the few of the ones that God has placed on my heart this morning to share with you. Amen. These three things almost, almost always start in our minds. These three things almost always start in the mind and flows to the heart. Let's look at what those things are. Number one of the main ingredients that Satan uses to destroy the spiritual family is alienation, separation, and no communication. Amen. You know, then, then you, when, when that happens, one of the things is, is I want to break them apart. How do I break God's spiritual family, break them apart? Because united, we're strong, but divided, we're weak. And so Satan breaks the people apart. How does he do that? You, to destroy the home and the sanctity of the family, Satan, and we'll look at a conventional family, just with human beings, not even the spiritual family. What does they, Satan do to break that family apart? Well, Satan first breaks apart the home, and he breaks apart the people. He separates the people. Autonomy and independence are not only in the physical sense. So we don't only, when we think of uh, just being autonomous, you think of, you, you envision someone being by themselves. But it also almost always happens through communication and connection. In the house, think about it. We've grown up in families, I know I have, where you would have two people living in the same home. Physically, they are not apart. They're together, but they do not speak to each other. They harbor resentment and quiet reservations in their hearts. Husbands and wives, roommates not speaking to each other, and they are in the same room sometimes. You have those thoughts that come about that person that's in the house with you. And we are in God's spiritual house. Amen. Amen. Satan's number one ingredients is separation, alienation, and no communication. With the children, placing a wedge between them and their parents. It's a powerful tool. From the very beginning, Adam and Eve, because of their sin, what did Satan use? He used he caused them, because of their sin, to lose their communication with God. And even today, that's one of Satan's tool is when we sin, we lose communication with God and Satan gets in. Number two, discouragement. Amen. Through lies. Discouragement. John 10, 10 says the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. And I have come that they may have life. Amen. And have it to the full. So Jesus's intention for us was always to give us life. But Satan, what does he do is he steals our joy kills our confidence in God, and he wants to destroy our hope, dreams, and our future. And this all happens first in the mind. The mind is a dangerous place to be. Countless scriptures talk about being strong and courageous. Why? Because one of the ways that, God, that Satan destroys the spiritual family of God is when we start to get discouraged. We start to think so negative about ourselves. I don't belong here. Who am I? I'm good for nothing. So many discouraging thoughts. It's too, I've gone too, too far. There's no way coming back. And he breaks us apart. You know, Jesus even needed angel twice to encourage him. Amen. Luke 22, 43, we're not going to go there. In Matthew 4, 11, it said that the, the angel had to come to Jesus to encourage him because With discouragement, God knew with discouragement, things can break apart fast. The third, discouragement kills family, 
It leads to sin and in turn kills communication. Hurt is the third, amen? Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind and compassionate to each, each other, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Look, here's the truth. We're in close spiritual quarters with one another. We're like in barracks, like, you know, in, in, you know, in army. We're in, a, we're in a home. We're in a spiritual household. And sometimes what I like what we to call what we have sp- love sparks. Amen. <laughs> They're love sparks. So different things that happen, you rub the person rubs you the wrong way, amen, says something to you, did something, or you probably felt in your mind that you were, you were not considered. And we have to have the ability to forgive each other and forgive quickly because without forgiveness, Satan uses that as a tool. All that hurt, the longer hurt stays on your heart, the more dangerous it is. It will tear us apart from the inside in, out. Amen? We have to forgive. And forgiveness is a decision. It's not a feeling. You just have to forgive. The feeling will follow. Amen? But you have to. Satan uses hurt to destroy the family. Unity is something we have to fight for. I was reading it in, 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 as in closing here. Uh, the, the, the helmet of salvation, you know, the, the, it, it's really in the mind. And it says the soldier had to wear the helmet of salvation. And uh, as we look in the scriptures, he would wear the helmet to protect his head. All of it. Even, I mean, in between his eyes. Because any fatal blow could, I mean, that's it. It's over. And usually, isn't that where Satan comes for us is in our minds? He comes first in the mind. And he knows once I get some poison in the mind, I'll, I'll tear apart the heart essentially breaking apart God's family. Closing off here, three things that you can do to ensure you protect God's family. Always communicate, amen? Always be open. Aaron and I, we always talk. One of the things I love about being home and being part of my family, and it's just incredible. I I just love, like, coming home to to, 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 to what, what I call family. Aaron and I always communicate. And to the point where sometimes I, I, we talk so much text message, we call, we, hey, sometimes Aaron will look at me and I know exactly what she means, amen. The, the, the other day, uh, 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 Connor was sitting down and he was watching a movie and, and Aaron was on the phone and she came in and she just pointed to her mouth and she was like, okay. And then I was like, yeah. I'm, and Connor was like, what, what did, I, do you know what she said? I was like, yeah. She asked me if I was hungry, did I eat already, amen. <laughs> and, uh. I just know my wife. I know she's, she's looking out for me. She wants to know, did you eat, babe? I want to make sure to take care of you. Uh, but that happens because we're so always taught. There's always communication. You end up understanding the person without even saying anything to them, amen? The, the second is always encourage each other. Find someone today and encourage that person. They may need your very encouragement, amen? Lift people up and always, always, always forgive. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Family, I don't know about you, but, you know, David said in Psalms that he'd rather be a gatekeeper in the house of God than anything else the world has to offer him. Because he was just so excited to be in God's kingdom. Do you have that heart this morning? Are you excited to be in God's kingdom this very day? You know, I don't want to be anywhere else in the world but in this room at this very hour. Because this is where I get to see the family. This is where I get to see God's people. And this is where I get to worship my king. You know, I'm just grateful to have this opportunity to preach. And I'm excited for it. Man, Joey should really stay out of commission, you know, a little bit more. Just a little bit more. A little bit more. I love you, bro. Just gives me the energy, the excitement. But thank you so much, bro, uh, for just the opportunity. Turn to Daniel chapter 3. That got your blood flowing, huh? Got your blood flowing. And in Daniel chapter 3, 
You know, every single revolution that shook the earth started with one man. It started with someone who was sick and tired of what was going on in this world. They saw the pain, they saw the hurt, and they chose to do something about it. They dared to go against the world. If you look at George Washington, John Adams, these men were men who dared to stand up and speak up. Martin Luther King, he saw the hate, the pain, the hurt of his people, of this world, and he chose to stand up and speak up. Nelson Mandela, he saw the pain, he saw the hurt of this world, and he dared to stand up when no one else will and speak up. Title of my lesson, Dare to Stand Against the World. You know, when I'm preaching, I love, you know, for you guys to preach back at me. There we go. Let me hear some kick me in the face. Let me hear some, ooh, that's how I know it's getting to you. Exactly. That's, that's how I know that you're actually paying attention. Daniel chapter 3 and in verses 7, just to give you a little bit of context of what's going on. In, um, in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 1, <laughs> context, context, there we go. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Now, for the sake of me not biting my tongue, I'm going to call him King Nene, okay? Amen? So King Nene had a dream that gave him goosebumps. And when he couldn't interpret or tell why he was having the same dream over and over and over again, he invites Daniel. And Daniel gives him the interpretation of the dream and tells him that there's a statue, head made of gold, and the rest of the body was not made of gold. And he was the gold, and then he got mad when Daniel essentially told him that your kingdom will not reign forever because the rest of the body was not gold. So he got furious, and guess what he did? He decided to build an entire statue, a dazzling statue, all made of gold, to make a statement to the world and to God that he is the entire statue. He is the ruler over the earth and not God. So in building this statue, he had to make sure that all of his leaders, everyone leading a province in Babylon, they had to make sure that they enforced the law, that at the sound of the trumpet, every knee will bow. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Praising King Nene, that he was the king of all. He was the greatest king ever. And let's see how this story unfolds. In verses 7, it says, Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Let's pause. It said every nation under heaven bowed down to a physical idol. No one could stand up for what was going on. Even the Jews, those who were God's people, fell on their knees. Verses 8, it says, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there's some Jews 
whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. You know, haters will always hate. It says that when the trumpet sound, everyone was on their knees. But far within, there was a shadow that was not on their knees. It was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three young men. And the haters, of course, the other leaders, go to King Nene and tell him, look, King Nene, you will live forever. But there's some guys over there. Those guys, they don't want to bow down to your statue. And King Nene was purple in the face. He was furious. And then he calls them to his throne. You know, it's the same in life. When you choose to stand up for what's right, you will always face opposition. And Instinctly, when you don't face opposition, it means you're following the crowd. So you got to ask yourself this morning, where do I stand? Have I been with the crowd or have I stood up for what's right? You know, King Nene calls them to his throne and he says, guys, I'm going to give you one more chance just because I love you guys. I like you guys. You guys are great leaders. And he tells them, once you hear it again, fall on your knees. And not only did they stand up, we're going to see how the story unfolds. And in verses 21, are you there with me? And, sorry, in verses 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve the, ger- the gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. You know, they had such a confidence that dazed the entire world. It shook King Nebuchadnezzar. First of all, they said, we don't have to answer to you, O Majesty. You know, you got you, you to be wise when you're talking to the big shots and the five talent guys. And, you know, you got to help them. You, you just got to help them out and encourage them a little. And then he tells them that even if, Our God doesn't save us. We're not going to bow down. It's not right. They didn't just stand up. They spoke up. You know, it was not okay what they saw. And imagine if you were there with me for a second. And you were a Jew. You were a believer. You were a disciple, a Christian. And you saw your fellow brothers and your sisters on their knees. Worshipping the idols of this world. You look to your left, and every head was bowed. You look to your right, and every head was bowed. Family, that's the same thing this morning. Outside of these walls, we have Christianity as a joke. Not just Christianity. We have people bowing down to pleasure. We have people bowing down to comfort. We have people bowing down to different idols that will be the death of them. But in this room, we're different. In this room, we choose to stand. In this room, we don't just stand, but we speak up. In this room, these are the believers that God will fight for. Look, family, it's very, very simple. 
every other Jew who put their knees to the ground decided to stay silent. They chose not to speak up. You know, here's the thing about silence, family. Silence has so much to say about someone. Silence really speaks loud. And it's interesting because in this scenario, when you look at the Jews, they cared much more about their lives than about God's glory. You know, family, when we choose to stay silent, we get to see the world and we get to see the pain and we get to see the hurt and we say nothing about it. We actually say it's okay. It's okay to see a young girl at a very young age be sexually abused. We say it's okay for a man to become a woman. We say it's okay to be involved in the heresy of this world. Sexual immorality, greed, hate. We say it's okay, America, to keep on sinning when we stay silent. But that's not who we are. We are those who have the hearts and the spirits of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, the interesting thing I love about these guys is because of their conviction, King Nene threw them into the furnace. And when he threw them into the furnace, immediately, almost immediately, he turns and he says, guys, didn't we throw three guys into the furnace? And they're like, yeah. And then he says, I see a fourth person. And it looks like it's the son of God. And finally, he runs himself to the furnace, and he says, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, get out of the furnace. And they walk out. It says there was not even a smell of smoke on them. And that moment, that very moment, King Nebuchadnezzar declared to the Babylonians that the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the God of the world. It was because of their stand for righteousness. It was because of their stand for what was right. It was because they chose not to stay silent. That they changed an entire nation, but not just the nations. In chapter 4, King Nene said that let the whole world hear the praises of the Lord. You know, even before the first century disciples evangelized the world, three men stood up against the world, and they evangelized the world. Family, when we stand up for what's right, when we preach to this world, when we preach to this generation, when we speak up, we have the opportunity to change this world. We have the opportunity to turn this world upside down. And I'm looking at the men and the women who will stand up and speak up. Amen. You know, it was, it was the same for me. After I became a disciple for two whole years, I chose not to stand up. I said, other people were doing it. They can do it. They don't need me. You know what I mean? If you, if you know what I mean, blink your eyes. There we go. And I remember watching people walk right past me, and I would not say a word. I knew in my soul that I had to share. I knew in my soul what they were going through. I could see it through their eyes, but I I chose to stay silent. Someone else is going to do it. Just like the Jews, I chose to bow down out of fear, and I said nothing. And you know what happened? Absolutely nothing. Today, where are they? I know of one student who actually committed suicide here at UTA. My silence murdered my friend. Your silence murders anyone who you choose not to speak up to. That's the depth of what your silence does. And after two years, I had to sit down with Fernando. And some of you know him, but he's the evangelist who now is in LA. 
And we talked. And I said, you know what, bro? I'm sick and tired of bowing down to this world. I am going to make a stand. Now, before I said that, I was nothing to nobody. No one knew me. No one remembered me because I did nothing. But after that very day, I remember being a madman on campus, standing up for what's right. I chose not to stay silent. Every single thing that moved, I spoke up. When I saw the sin of the world, when I saw people going to clubs, going to parties, thinking it's okay because everyone is doing it. It's okay to bow down to another guy, to another girl, to a relationship, to money. I said, it's not okay, and you've got to learn the truth. And because of that, family, because of that, there are people in this room who will never forget me. How many of you remember that one brave soul who reached out to you? How many of you know their name? That's the impact you can make when you speak up, family. And my challenge for you is very simple. It's so simple. We have a campaign that's been laid out before us. The Bible says give yourself wholly, fully to the work of the Lord. Family, I want to dare you to stand up for what's right and give yourself wholly, fully to the work of the Lord. And in this, I guarantee you, family, we will change this world. We will turn this world upside down. But why stop at the campaign? Why just stop at giving yourself wholly for two weeks? Let your life be a campaign. Live this life until the very day when you get to meet our maker. And he opens up his arms with a big hug. And he says, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Family, that's who we are. That's what we can do because that is who God has called each and every one of you to become. The Shadrachs, the Meshachs, the Abednego. So I dare you, family, to stand up and speak up. I love you all. To God be the glory. Awesome, family. Well, I think your prayers have been being heard because my voice is feeling much better now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all as I preach God's word. Amen. Um, the title of my charge is simply faith is the solution for everything. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we'll read here in verse 14. But, you know, I don't know what trial you're going to this today, this week, this month. But I know that whatever we're going through, the answer will always be faith, right? Whether it be financial hardships, relationships, marriage, family, school, the answer is always going to be faith. So the real question is, do you have the faith? And yes, you do. Every single person here has the faith to deal with any problem that comes your way. How do I know? Well, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, it says, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So right here the Bible is saying that everyone that's a Christian believes what? That Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Let's think about this, guys. We have so much faith that we believe a dead man was revived. That's how much faith every single one of you has right this moment. And if you have that faith, let me ask you, what challenge in your life is more difficult than raising the dead? You know, I've seen marriages get restored. I've seen people overcome addictions. I've seen people get out of debt. But you know what I haven't seen? Someone who's dead come back to life. And yet I know that it happened. So if God can do that, 
What problem is too big that God cannot solve this morning? See, we all have the faith, right? But are we using the faith that we all have, that God has given each and every one of you? You know, uh, let's turn over our Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. And my one and only point for you guys is faith is not based on circumstance. And in Matthew 14, we'll go ahead and pick up here in verse 22. It says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell them to come to you. Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked in the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was terrified and began and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? So we see that here Jesus, he had just got done feeding the 5,000, right? So Jesus had just got finished serving tons of people, him and his disciples. So what does Jesus do when he's tired? He goes to pray, right? And so he sends his disciples out ahead of him, right? And so they're on the boat, and the wind carries them a little bit further than he would have thought. So Jesus goes, all right, and just starts walking in the water towards him. Right? So they've already been facing harsh winds, right? So the boat's already unsteady. And they see Jesus walking on the water. And it says they were terrified. And yet Jesus calms down, calms them down, and says, Hey, don't worry, it's me. You know, and, and this wind here represents the troubles that can take us away from Jesus. Yeah. You know, the wind had carried them away from Jesus, and so Jesus had to come to them. And yet, as he goes to them, Peter sees Jesus on the water and says, Jesus, if that's you, call out to me. Tell me to walk on the water with you. And Peter has the faith to begin to walk on water. It's incredible. But what happens? Peter sees the wind and begins to sink. See, Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. And uh, he focused not on Jesus who was walking the water, who was performing the miracle, but he put his eyes on the circumstance. And because of it, he begins to sink in his faith. You know, it's incredible. Jesus reaches out to him and picks him up. You know, so many times we can begin to sink in our faith and Jesus extends his hand and picks us right back up. Amen. But what we see from here is that so many times we can allow the circumstance to determine our faith instead of allowing our faith to determine our circumstance. And why does this happen? Because we take our eyes off of Jesus. You know, the moment we take our eyes off Jesus is the moment we'll begin to sink the moment we begin to feel overwhelmed. Like the circumstance, the trials, the troubles are too much. Right? And at the whole time, Jesus was there. See, we had the faith to overcome it. But we took our eyes off of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12. You know, I don't know what, your, what struggles what troubles are coming your way right now? Maybe it's, it is financial troubles. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's mental health. Or maybe fruitlessness. Could be family, school, or even marriage. 
right? We can't allow the troubles in these circumstances to determine our faith. But in fact, these things can be turned around by our very own faith. I mean, even with health, right? I mean, there's so many people sick right now, but think about it, guys. If Jesus rose from the dead, what sickness, what health problem is worse than death? Right? And so if God can do that with Jesus, there's nothing that God cannot do in our life. You know, I remember, you know, just two years ago, you know, before the Chavez's came to the church, you know, and the church had been stagnant. And we had a lot of potential in the church. But what was lacking was faith. And what did the Chavez's come to do? Well, their main thing was they injected the church with faith. You know, not only that, you know, after they had done that, the church was able to more than double in less than two years. And then this past summer, you know, when the Chavez's were called to go to L.A., right? And, you know, you would think that, man, they were what helped grow the church so much. Can the church really be the same without them? And yet what's incredible is that we have such a faith-filled church right here. Every single one of you is so filled with faith, so much so that even after the challenge left and 30 other disciples left, as a church, we had 15 baptisms in less than two months. So guys, that doesn't happen if you don't have faith. So we are those that have great faith. And yet there's times where our faith can be challenged. And there will be times this, the rest of this year that it will be challenged. Right? And so I have a challenge for you. That as the rest of the year comes along, as the trials come, as the wind blows, right, keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't focus on the problem. So many times when things get difficult, we feel like, no, no, I can't focus on God right now. I got to focus on fixing this problem. And that's the moment we begin to sink, right? If you're studying the Bible and you're going through things, right, you, you may be tempted, hey, I want to study, but I got things going on in my life right now, right? If you have things going on in your life, that's when you need the Bible even more. Don't stop studying the Bible. Continue. Do what the Bible says. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Guys, if we do this, right, then we will be able, just as Peter, to walk on water. Guys, we are a church of faith. But the winds of troubles, trials, and persecutions are going to come, and the temptation is going to be to take our eyes off Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us not lose heart, my brothers and sisters. Let us not lose focus, my brothers and sisters. Let us, but let us have an either, even greater faith because it doesn't matter how big the trials are in our life. We have a God who can raise the dead from the grave. Therefore, he can provide a solution for our problems. All it requires is faith because faith is the solution for everything. And with that, to God be the glory.